Welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast. I'm your host, Mike DiGirolamo, bringing you weekly conversations with experts, activists, scientists, and journalists working on the front lines of conservation. Manga Bay is an award-winning nonprofit news source that shines a light on some of the most pressing issues facing our planet, while delivering journalism that holds power to account. This podcast is recorded and edited on Gadigal land. Deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon falls 22% in 2023. We're going to talk about it today with Manga Bay's editor-in-chief and CEO, Rhett Butler. We're also going to discuss a few more recent exciting developments, including the launch of Manga Bay's new bureau in Africa and the Biophilia Award for Environmental Communication, which has been awarded to Manga Bay this year. Rhett also shares details on a few more exciting additions to the newsroom for readers and listeners to look forward to, in 2024. Um, so, Rhett, welcome back to the Manga Bay Newscast. Uh, it's been, I think it's been a, over, a little over a year since we last spoke. Um, and at that time, that was just before um, the Brazilian presidential election. So a lot has, has happened since then. Uh, but we're going to talk about a few exciting developments today, including the launch of Manga Bay's new bureau in Africa. And the the exciting award that our newsroom just won, which is the Biophilia Award, and also some new data showing a significant decline in Amazon deforestation that we reported uh, in mid November. Um, but I want to first start by giving you a moment to talk about some of your recent travels. So I understand you've been traveling to places like the Amazon, and you recently you recently were involved in something with the X Prize Foundation in Los Angeles. So um, why don't you go ahead and uh, and tell us what you were doing on those fronts. Uh, yeah, so a couple months ago, I was down in the um, Ecuadorian Amazon. Uh, and so I got out to this really beautiful site. Well, a couple of beautiful sites, but this one that was really spectacular, which was right on the border of this national park that has a volcano. And there's this large valley that's that's completely, uh, you know, intact forest. And it's um, there's an indigenous reserve next to this this private reserve, which is then, you know, runs up against this large national park. And um, it just has stunning levels of biodiversity. It's very scenic because again, you're at kind of the top of this, of this hill and you look down into this canyon, which has waterfalls coming down and just gorgeous forests. Um, so that was a really nice trip. Uh, I went down there to work on finalizing a new fellowship for for indigenous reporters in the Amazon. Uh, and then I also visited a couple of conservation projects uh, and then I had a few other things that works. So that was, um, that was the Amazon trip over the summer. And then, yeah, the most, I just got back from uh, Los Angeles where I was at uh, the x Prize, um convening. So this was, uh, it's called their Visioneering Conference and it's where mm-hmm. people or come together around different domains. So my domain was biodiversity and conservation and propose ideas for the next X prize. So if you're not familiar with the X prize, uh, what it is is it's, uh, you know, this, this group puts together a, a chunk of money, uh, for, uh, uh ent- entities to compete, um, you know, to win this prize to sort of catalyze investment, um, towards a solution. Um, and so the current X Prize in sort of the biodiversity space is called um, the Rainforest X Prize, mm-hmm. and so I think it's like a ten million dollar prize. Um, but they're trying to greatly increase the ability, uh, our ability to understand uh, biodiver- rainforest biodiversity. So the idea is, is there's like a bunch of technologies that that are brought together by a team to. Uh, assess a wide range of, of animals and ecosystem functions and also plants. So biodiversity, but also ecosystem function, and then be able to capture that information, report it back uh, in a near real time basis. And so that process, th- this competition has been running for, I think, two years now, and they've gone from a large number of competitors down to six. Um, and so I got together with uh, 12 to 15 other people who kind of work in the conservation realm to pitch ideas about what the next prize could be. And so there was actually like a competition for the next prize. And so I think we started with 12 ideas and then it went down to four and then two and one. So it was a really interesting process. A lot of incredibly smart and accomplished people 
in the room. So even beyond sort of the prize process, it was just great, you know, connecting with all these people. That that sounds exciting. I mean, uh, for for listeners that aren't aware, we've also reported on the X Prize Foundation before and and their um, their recent developments. Uh, so if you want to read more about it, I'll link um, Abishyant Kittingor's reporting in the show notes of this podcast for you to check that out. Um, so let's let's uh let's dive into the 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 good news, uh, which is that um, for the year ending in July thirtieth, twenty twenty three, uh, Brazil's space agency, which is the, under the acronym. INPE. It says that deforestation has decreased by uh, 22%. So that sounds really, really great. Um, but what does this data tell us exactly? And uh, what are some key takeaways from this that you want people to know? Well, data is certainly very positive and it con- confirms the trend that we've seen in the past several months since uh, uh, President Lula got reelected. Um, and so you know, most notably, this is the lowest deforestation rate uh, for any year since 2018. Mm-hmm. So Bolsonaro took over in January 2019. And so while he was in power, uh, deforestation increased very significantly. Um, and so this is a, a notable development for sure. Um, it's it's the first time that deforestation has been below 10,000 square kilometers again since 2018. So it's mm-hmm. just over 9,000. Um, the caveat is this data is preliminary. So the final data will come out uh, again, probably around April, but the final data is usually not that different from the the preliminary est- estimate from, from EMPAD. So definitely a good sign in terms of forest conservation. Mm-hmm. But sort of the good news is offset by the fact that the Brazilian Amazon is experiencing one of the worst droughts on record right now. Right. So large areas of the Amazon are very hot and dry. So there's been an increase in fires, rivers are drying up. I'm, I'm sure wildlife is suffering, but certainly, you know, communities, including indigenous communities are having a hard time. Um, and so one of the big concerns around drought is it reduces the resilience of the Amazon to re- reduce or sorry, to resist fire. Mm-hmm. Um, but also you tend to have large scale forest die off. So again, like there's good news that deforestation driven by people is declining, but at the same time, there's the severe drought, which is degrading the forest very significantly. Right. Um, and it's something I was curious about is, um, so last time, you know, the first time actually that Lula took office, there was also a similar sort of, uh, decline in, um, in deforestation and it got down to, it got down to a certain level. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, we're not quite, we're not at that level, that, that historical level yet. Do you expect, or would you expect potentially to see deforestation continue to, cl- to decline in the coming months and years? Basically, what should we be, lo- be looking out for c- going into the new year? Uh, yeah. So when, uh, Lula took office, Deforestation was significantly higher than it is today. So 2004 peaked around 20, almost 28,000 square kilometers, whereas this past year was 9,000. Mm-hmm. Um, at the end of his time in office, it was more like seven to 8,000, maybe he's even in the 6,000. So deforestation currently is higher than it was, you know, when he left office, mm-hmm. but not nothing compared to where it was when he started. Right. So, um, when he took office, he implemented the first time he implemented this plan to reduce deforestation in the Amazon. And, you know, sort of subsequent analysis has concluded that government policy was indeed a very significant factor in that drop in deforestation. Mm-hmm. And so since he's come back, he's also prioritized uh, a plan to reduce deforestation. And so he's implementing new, you know, new approaches for reducing deforestation, but also putting money and resources into the uh, prior approaches that also reduced deforestation. So those, you know, those mechanisms were were cut or reduced under um, Bolsonaro. Right. And so I think, you know, we should see, I mean, theoretically, we should see this this trend continue, mm-hmm. declining deforestation. And, um, you know, Lula has said it is a priority. Uh, and notably, Lula has also been trying to get more international support for reducing deforestation globally. So um, Brazil has formed an alliance with Indonesia and the Democratic Republic of Congo to also 
cut deforestation. So those are the three countries with the largest area of tropical forest. And so, yeah, I, I, I would expect that we should see this trend again to continue. The sort of countervailing sort of trend is that the Amazon is being affected more and more by these, you know, climate change yeah, uh, and also forest degradation. And so those are factors kind of working against um, uh, sort of conservation progress in the region. Indeed. Um, well, so we're going to shift now to another uh, another bit of exciting news, uh, which is that Manga Bay just won the 2023 Biophilia Award, which is a, a top prize for you know communicating environmental news. Um, past winners of it include The Guardian, New Yorker staff writer Elizabeth Colbert, and many other you know fine journalists. So I want to talk about this for a minute here, Rhett. So how do you feel about our organization winning this award? What does this mean for Manga Bay and for environmental communication in general? Well, it's certainly a great honor and great recognition of the hard work Manga Bay's doing for a really, really long time. And so that's, you know, both our staff, but also our network of contributors. Um, we have about a thousand contributors and roughly 70 countries. And so we focus on this beat for so long, our biodiversity beat. Um, and it was amazing to see this award established five years ago, you know, finally recognizing the importance of journalism and communication around biodiversity. Um, but actually when it is even, it's even better. Yeah. So yeah, it was very exciting, <laughs> a wonderful honor. And, um, you know, I, it's just like another sort of uh, another recognition for manga that I think is really important. I feel like we've kind of been under the radar for so long, yeah. Um, that it's very nice to sort of you know win this accolade. Yeah, and and on that note, something you you said to um, the BBVA when you were speaking to them is that you, you mentioned that environmental journalism in general is increasingly relevant to people's lives, and I think that that's spot on. Um, and you went on to say, and I'm quoting you directly, we are a translation service between the scientists and their data and what people are observing with their own eyes. And this is of great value both in informing the public and possibly leading them to change their behavior. So um, I, I totally agree. I, what what do you hope people are taking away from the content that they are they're reading and hearing that we're making? Well, so Magami's approach has always been to provide information to help people make decisions rather than telling them what to do. And so, I mean, that's true today as well. And so I feel like having this network, global network of journalists who are, many of whom are frontline reporters gathering sort of those, that, that, that information from the field and then bringing it to, you know, audiences all over the world and then explaining, you know, why this is sort of relevant to people. Again, not telling what to do, but, you know, providing the context and connecting these issues to people's everyday lives is a really important thing to do. And as we see the effects of environmental degradation get more and more apparent for people, um, a lot of folks are wondering, you know, what's causing this or, you know, why is this happening? And so we can provide that, that context, which I think is really helpful to people. Um, and so I feel like Manga Bay's role is getting more and more important uh, as we see the effects of climate change and other forms of environmental damage. And, and you know, obviously, uh, it's, you know, it's no news to anyone that climate change is, is like probably one of the most talked about topics in environmental news. And uh, is there any, is there any topic that you feel like flies under the radar that you, you just wish more environmental news outlets could highlight or, or, or is something that you think is is still quite difficult to talk to audiences about? Well, I think consumption is is an issue that everyone's aware of, but it's it tends to be hard to sort of convey the the bigger picture of it. So, I mean, it, it is really like overconsumption or unsustainable consumption. Right. So, you know, the projections now are that population growth. Or the global population should should stabilize between twenty seventy and twenty eighty. Um, we don't know when consumption will will peak, and so 
if that consumption is not sustainable, it means we could still see, you know, greater and greater demand for resources going, you know, out 50, 100 or more years. And again, like if we're not, if it's not sustainable or we're not careful about it, then, you know, that could have real detrimental impacts on the people and other species that share the planet, sort uh, of regardless of what the human population is. So it's kind of like, um, so I feel like that could, Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, so it, it, it's it's kind of like these consumption issues of where, you know, as as economies in countries are developing and they're requesting or investing in more in things like beef production or, you know, producing products that, that rely on commodities like palm oil or critical minerals, then this complicates the situation regardless of how many people are on the planet because the consumption just keeps going up. And and I, what I hear you saying is it's sort of difficult to communicate that nuance to people. Um, yeah, but I wouldn't say it's like people in developing countries. I mean, it's people in the United States and Europe as well. Right, I mean, right. You know, we're consuming, uh, we're, we're sort of like the model for, I guess, what not to do in terms of consumption. Yeah, right. And, yeah. you know, we, if you're looking at the U.S. as an outsider, it seems like we've got pretty nice, nice lives and a lot of, you know, great things in our lives. And so why not like, why shouldn't we be able to mm -hmm. consume like Americans? And so, you know, we're not really setting a good example for anyone, um, but it's not, you know, we, we need to have like a leadership role in terms of, you know, if we're going to shift towards a more sustainable economy. And I think Europe is further ahead of the U.S. in that regard in terms of concern about envir environmental performance and state sustainability. Um, but it's certainly on us, uh, you know, we need to you know, clean up what we're doing. Yeah. Before we, you know, <laughs> try to tell other people what what to do. Yeah, very much, very much agree. Um, so what do you hope Manga Bay looks like in five years? Um, so one of the things that we worked on last year and early into this year was our twenty thirty strategic plan, and so that provides a roadmap of how we plan to expand our impact over the next few years. Um. And so, you know, five years is, is well into that roadmap. And so we are, we have a lot of ambitions. Like we want to really expand where we feel like we can have a high marginal impact. Um, so the, the strategy is structured around five areas. Um, I don't know the degree which you want to go, go into these too much, but, you know, basically we want to be able to reach, we, we want to have our journalism reach people who are key decision makers, um, you know, in geographies where journals can, can drive impact. And so, um, you know, there's certain countries and certain regions of the world where, um, you know, you have the ability for journals to drive impact. Um, we also want to support, um, our network of, of journalists. And so that means both offering opportunities for professional journalists to get paid for reporting uh, on these critical issues but also helping build the capacity of the next generation of journalists uh, through fellowship programs and other opportunities. Um, another priority for us is working to keep journalists safe uh, because journalists are uh, facing increasing dangers in the world um, from the type of, type of work they do. And we want to help, we want to help journalists be safe in the field and, you know, do their work uh, in a way that doesn't put their lives at risk. And so, um, there's various ways where we plan to do that, but that is another priority for us. And then going back to the first point, we also know that the way people consume information is changing. Mm -hmm. And so having the ability to be responsive to that, um, in terms of the formats people are consuming, um, but also reaching some audiences that have been traditionally been underserved. Um, from an environmental standpoint, environmental information standpoint. Right. Well said. Um, and, and speaking of that, um, we have we have actually expanded. We we've created a new a new bureau now. Um, and so I want to I want to dive into that a little bit. So we've officially launched our sixth international news bureau, which is uh, which is Manga Bay, Manga Bay Africa. Um, it's going to be a bilingual team uh, covering Africa in both French and English. And you know we've had staff. Um, covering the African continent for, you know, for years. So what's, what's changed now with, uh, this formation of the Bureau and can you talk about the significance of publishing 
um, that content in in multiple languages. Yeah. So as you mentioned, we've had African staff for a while now, but if we look at our coverage of Africa relative to other geographies, uh, it's definitely less. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. just pulling up a map of our staff and contributors, we have 166 across LATAM, or that's what we had when we did our last count. Wow. We have um, over 330 in South and Southeast Asia. Uh, and then in Africa, we only have uh, in the mid 50s. Okay. So on a relative basis, it's small. Um, and what that means is that the number of stories we cover in Africa has traditionally been smaller. Um, but if you look at trends, um, the l largest share of the world's population growth over the next 50 years is going to be in Africa. You know, the largest increase in energy production and consumption mm -hmm. in the next 50 years is going to be in Africa. So there's a lot of trends converging around Africa being really critical for the future of the planet. Um, and so we have a responsibility to, to improve our coverage on the continent. And so by creating a bureau, what it does is it, it builds the infrastructure that allows us to scale our coverage across Africa. Um, so it has a management structure. It has, you know, production infrastructure, production infrastructure means the ability to produce written audio and video content, um, to establish a network of local journalists to build relationships with local media outlets, which gets us larger reach. Um, so those are all components of, of, you know, establishing a bureau. And so by going from a desk to a bureau, um, we should be able to greatly expand our, our coverage across the continent. Um, so our strategy around Mongo Bay Africa is initially focusing on two languages. So English and French. And the reason for that is our primary target audiences are key decision makers. So within key decision makers, there's like a bunch of subgroups, which is the high level key decision makers. And we find that in the geographies where we feel like we can have the most impact, those people tend to speak either English or French. Mm -hmm. um, we have a strategy around other languages, but during phase one, we're focused really on, on French and English. Mm -hmm. um, and so the initial priority is West and Central Africa. So that's, uh, yeah, I mean, so again, that's French and English works pretty well there. Um, longer term, we'd also want to have a hub around Southern Africa and East Africa. We probably won't work much in North Africa, just given our focus, our, our current focus on, on the tropics and biodiversity hotspots. All right. Um, well, I'm personally excited, uh, you know, having just wrapped up, um, our, our Mongo Bay Explorers podcast season on the Congo Basin, uh, I, I definitely, I can understand that there's a lot of information um, to, to cover, you know, just in that one specific region. And so I'm, I'm very excited to see what we produce uh, because it is a, it's a region that has so many, so many um, things to talk about and, and cover. Um, we, we hired David Akana, who's a, a really esteemed environmental journalist in Africa to, to manage the bureau, and he has a he has a deep background in the sector there. So, what's your what's your sense for Africa's current media landscape after getting to know David? How do you see Mongabe fitting into it? Yeah, we're really excited about having David on the team. So, uh, David is Cameroonian, and Cameroon sits at sort of a interesting nexus of having both West African forests, but also Congo Basin forests. And it's also bilingual. So it's kind of like a microcosm for what we're trying to do in West Central Africa. Right. Um, with regard to the media landscape, so Africa is quite fragmented in terms of, uh, you know, countries. So it's not like Indonesia where, you know, there's like a single unified language, a single, a single country, even though there's like a lot of diversity within Indonesia. So Africa's tricky because each country has its own, um, you know, legal systems, government, um, sort of rules around media, um, uh, environmental policy, things like that. So it is trickier. Um, but I think that our approach of having local correspondents can help us be very adaptive to, to conditions. Um, so all of our content, like all of, like all of Mongo Bay, 
all of our content, all of our written content is open creative commons license. So it means anyone can use, use it commercially or non-commercially. And so we think that's going to be really important for reaching people in Africa. So I think in, in some countries, it'll be easier than others to build relationships with local media to republish our stories, but also potentially adapt our stories into other languages. Mm-hmm. Um, we're also looking at other mechanisms for reaching people. So audio content, uh, messaging platforms. And so we have some very exciting and significant new initiatives that are going to roll out next year, which will be very supportive for our work in Africa, but also other parts of the world as well. Mm. Um, we can revisit that next year once we do our next podcast interview. But uh, yeah, so essentially the the media landscape is more complicated than a lot of places that we operate just by virtue of there being many more countries that we're planning to, to have a presence in. Um, but having local expertise will be really critical for being effective and making these efforts a success. I mean, I mean, this is all exciting. Are there any other plans or hopes for the bureau that you that you want to talk about? Um, so, like all our bureaus, Mangabe Africa will be fairly autonomous, so they will determine their editorial priorities, um, giving the uh, issues around energy in Africa, both at uh, energy access, but also planned investment in, in energy extraction. Um, I think energy will be a major topic for Mangabe Africa um, that they'll, they'll focus on. But again, it's it's up to the Bureau to decide what their priorities are. Um, I'm sure that conservation will be a big topic. Um, uh, fisheries management, ocean oceans will also be a big one. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I'm excited to see you know, what the Bureau does. And, uh, you know, we're currently building up the team now. So, uh, a year from now we should have, you know, more than twice as many people as we currently have, uh, working across the continent. That sounds great. I, I, again, I can't tell you how excited I am about this. This is really, really glad to see this happen. I'm so on that note, I, what are some other upcoming, um, priorities or initiatives that we're, that we're doing at Monga Bay in general that, that you want to talk about? Uh, yeah, so one of the things that we're going to rely on is a short form news service. Um, as so a short form news service is articles that are 500 words or less. It serves a lot of different purposes, but one of the things is to help make our content more accessible to more mainstream audiences. And so mm-hmm. if we do an investigate, like a 5,000 word investigation, there may be several key findings. Breaking each of those findings into its own story. Um, it's more bite-sized, um, we feel will help us reach more people. Um, we've also developed this gap within Manga Bay in recent years where we have a harder time turning around breaking news, mm-hmm. whether that's a, you know, like a conservation agreement being signed or a, pa- a paper coming out. And so we feel like the short form news service could help us address that gap. So we can still do kind of Manga Bay's typical like longer form feature on something, but having that initial coverage, uh, we think can be quite valuable. Um, it will also allow us to track certain beats more, more easily or more responsibly. So there may be, there may be things that happen around a certain issue that don't quite warrant a full feature, but they could, but a, a short summary of what's happening or a short update could be very valuable. Um, another thing with the short form news service is we think uh, it will be easier to work with local partners um, if we're dealing with shorter form news. Um, so adapting or translating a, a 500 word story is, is easier than a 2000 word story. And so as we expand in new markets, we think that uh, building partnerships will be easier around that short form news product. Uh, and then another thing that we're, that we think that short form news will be useful for is uh, with our short form video content specifically script writing. So the, the, the sort of simpler style um, we think will will lend really well to developing the um, the short form uh, video pieces. Um, so we're, we're quite excited about the short form news service. And I should just emphasize that this is not replacing any Manga Bay um, content. This is right. uh, additive. <laughs> right. So we're not just into like a short form newswire service. Mm-hmm. This is something that we're doing in addition to what we're, what we're currently doing. So we should see a, 
a very significant increase in sort of the total number of stories that are produced by Mongo next year as a as a result of this new service. Well, uh, Rhett, that that is a lot of good news <laughs> um, in, in into one podcast here. So uh, it's uh, it's great to see you again. Uh, glad you could uh, join us this year to to, to give us the, the breakdown. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll talk again next year. Yep, sounds great. Thanks for having me. Find more information about the launch of Mongabay's Africa Bureau, the Biophilia Award, and our coverage of the X Prize by clicking links in the show notes. And as always, if you're enjoying the Mongabay Newscast or any of our podcast content, such as our sister series, Mongabay Explores, and you want to help us out, You can spread the word about the work we're doing by telling a friend. Word of mouth is still the best way to help expand our reach and keep growing. But did you know you can also support us by becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Mongabay. Mongabay is a nonprofit news outlet. Even just a dollar per month really does help us offset production costs. So if you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, head to patreon.com forward slash Mongabay to learn more and support the Mongabay newscast and all of our podcast content. You and your friends can join the listeners who have downloaded the Mongabay newscast well over half a million times by subscribing to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. Or you can download our app for Apple and Android devices. Just search either app store for the Mongabay newscast app to gain fingertip access to new shows and all of our previous episodes. And of course, you can read our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mongabay.com. Or if you prefer to follow us on social media, find Mongabay via our accounts on LinkedIn at Mongabay News or on Instagram threads, Blue Sky, Mastodon, Facebook and TikTok, where our handle is at Mongabay or on YouTube at Mongabay TV. Thanks, as always, for listening.